Hey, what's up? Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, I wanted to thank everyone who has filled out the Multitude listener survey. If you go to bit.ly slash Multitude survey, all lowercase, you can fill out a survey which helps us out so much. It gives us a better sense of who you are, who listens to the show, what things you like from us, areas in which we can improve, what things interest you, all sort of stuff like that, because Multitude is getting ready to take the next step in terms of the things that we do and the media that we create and the content that we produce for you folks so getting to know our audience better helps us so much and if you fill out the survey which takes no more than five minutes you are entered into the running to win a sticker pack from us which is super great so again that is bit.ly slash multitude survey speaking of multitude if you haven't listened to other multitude shows you are missing out in addition to potterless there's spirits which is basically like drunk history but about mythology there's join the party which is a real play dungeons and dragons podcast that's super fun there is way station which is a fan cast about the canadian show lost girl and there's horror which is a show that I work on with Eric Silver talking about basketball, but only the fun stuff. None of the wins and losses, only the silly things. If you want to find out anything about all those shows, you can go to multitude.productions. Also, today's episode is brought to you by Stitch Fix. Real talk, Stitch Fix is incredible. This thing is nuts. They send clothes to you on whatever basis that you want. A personalized box, you get paired with a personalized stylist. And if you go to stitchfix.com slash potterless, when you sign up for your account, if you keep all the stuff they send you in your box, you get 25% off. I'm going to talk more about my experience with them in the middle of the show, but I am not exaggerating. The service is phenomenal, and I'm so glad they're sponsoring the show. And speaking of supporting the show, we have new patrons. Welcome to the team. So shout out to Elizabeth Williams, Camelia Holmes, Matt Bishop, Sophia Carnero, Cassandra Wyant, Anna Johnson Igsy, Megan Mullen, Alexis Baird, Allison Turner, Andrea Crock, Jessica Rose Jackson, Morgan Beard, Jessica L. Snide, Mindy Daggerman, Brittany Jane Morad, Alice, Asa Grant, Ali Oshner, Crystal Powell, Joey Jarlnick, Georgia Monks, Kerry Huval, Rita Makinen, Siobhan Ellsbury, Amy Perkins, Emily Schwager, Anya Lawrence, Maddie Brockmeyer, and Jess McDonald, and a huge shout out to our newest producer level patrons, Isabel, Steve Trelower, Vivian Santos, Kim Klusmeyer, Samuel Miner, Megan Leach, Ali Ravik, and Sean Cho. They joined the ranks of <gasps> Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Louise, Akancha, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamal, Anthony, Diego, Russell, Jenny, Dustin, Katie, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossan, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Chrissy, Shrina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Sammy, Lovekesh, Giovanni, Ali, Kalmich, Cassandra, Roxy, Melissa, Amelia, Vince, Sean, Jeremiah, Courtney, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Emily, Francisco, Rachel, Mary, Marcus, Zachary, Gabrielle, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brendy, Melody, Kristen, Jonathan, Lexi, Zach, Elisa, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, and Joe, who always put their leftovers in the microwave for just the right amount so it's not too hot and not too cold. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons, you can head to patreon.com slash potterless and you get access to bonus content like bonus episodes, my notes, exclusive merchandise. Again, it's patreon.com slash potterless. So without further ado, let's get into episode 49 of Potterless covering chapter 19 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, guest starring Megan Fruhoff, my sister. Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. I'm that 26-year-old man. My name is Mike Schubert, and I am here with a very special guest, uh, my beloved older sister, (laughs) Megan, who has hated my dislike of the Harry Potter series for years upon years, and now finally the script has been flipped. So, Megan, did you ever think we would be here doing this? I cannot (laughs) say that I ever predicted this <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that i could either <laughs> it, it hurts my heart a little bit because on one hand i'm like i told you so you should have read these so long ago but on the other i'm like look what came of you being so stubborn <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so good it's, it's so true there was someone on the uh, on the potterless facebook group at one point we were getting into a playful argument because i am still very firmly on team it's the put outer it's not called the deluminator oh. Uh, oh, and, yeah, and well. <laughs> we will see we will see but basically yeah. she was making the point that like you know it's just a name that harry as the narrator came up with and i was like well regardless of if that's the reason someone that young still could have come up with a better name yeah i don't even think it was harry honestly because it's no. in the first scene it's just like you know just like a random narrator dictating what he sees uh-huh. because he doesn't even really call out mcgonagall or dumbledore at first like he calls out the tabby cat and, and yeah. whatever 
whatever. I don't even know if it's tapped. It's a weird thing that we'll get into later at another time because I have many thoughts about it. But basically, (laughs) I was saying I could have thought of a better name for that even as a kid. And she on the Facebook group said, well, I don't know how smart of a kid you were. You didn't read the Harry Potter books. And I wrote, well, clearly very smart because look (laughs) at me now. Like if I had read them as a kid, none of this would have happened. So maybe it was all maybe it was just all meant to be. But yes, I'm I'm happy to have you on the podcast. I'm glad we're here. I'm and now so happy to be here. <laughs> our relationship can continue to blossom because now we have uh, Harry Potter stuff to talk well, about, which like we never now, had before. I know. I I almost feel bad, but it's like now all we talk about is Harry Potter. <laughs> we have ages to make up for. Oh, I know. <laughs> so I mean, this is I, we're this catching is up. All I wanted to talk to you about all the time <laughs> through, you know, grade school and high school. And now, you know. It's like all this pent up Harry Potter knowledge and obsession (laughs) that I have. I'm just like flourishing it out. I was thinking about it. I mean, my I I mean, you obviously knew me growing up and you knew slash still know how obsessed I am with Disney princesses. Oh, very much. I mean, I would say that my Harry Potter obsession is kind of on par with that. So wow. So okay. So Cinderella or Harry Potter? Okay. Well, what does it come down to? Because that's a tough one. I have to go. Okay. Speaking of, did you see the new Wreck-It Ralph trailer where she breaks the shoe to try to shank someone because Cinderella is now the best princess? (laughs) She's obviously a badass. Obviously, (laughs) and I was correct in having her be my favorite. Although. Although, like, now I find myself, of course, being super Sleeping Beauty obsessed because I did name my daughter Aurora because... Yeah. Okay, I, I gotta say this, though. I am obsessed with Disney princesses. I mean, I'm just gonna say this, though. <laughs> Hot take, like... Sleeping Beauty is like the worst one. What? Like I love, what did she do? She fell asleep. She was bad okay. at sewing and fell asleep. <laughs> okay, that's not what happened. Have you ever even seen the movie? I, I, I probably have, but I really don't remember it. All I remember <laughs> is her falling asleep and then there was a yeah. big dragon. She gets possessed by Maleficent and Maleficent mm-hmm. makes this spinning wheel appear and she like, zombie walks her into pricking the needle so it's not really uh, okay. her so, fault so it wasn't her lack of seamstress skills exactly and okay. I don't really it's not a sewing thing it's like spinning wool into thread mm-hmm. oh okay so yeah. pre-sewing exactly okay. exactly <laughs> well I do love your daughter my niece Aurora yeah, she's a patron you. of the podcast I so know, I of know. course I love her <laughs> <laughs> so anyway now that we've talked about not Harry Potter for yeah, a while exactly. let's talk Sorry. about Harry Potter so you have called these chapters when I started the podcast you were like hey when you get to book six chapters 19 through 22 I want them well, so yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, you and Kelly kind of called them at the same time. In reality, (laughs) your girlfriend Kelly and I had a bit of a fake argument about who would get the chapter after me. And I, of course... You have to pick Kelly. I mean, I get I mean, it. to be fair, she <laughs> is more of the reason why the podcast happened. Uh, I agree. Because she got me off my butt to actually read the books. But yes. I'm very glad, though, that you you wanted at least something towards the end of book six. And I can see why, because these chapters are incredible. Well, and in my chapters, I do get, you know, my favorite movie scene. I know I've talked to you about this. Ooh, yes. I'm excited to get there. Yeah. Let it just be known that I was the first one to tell you to read these books. <laughs> you were. You definitely <laughs> <laughs> were you were the first mom was the second and I was like but mom you also told me to read Lion Witch in the Wardrobe and that didn't go well Ugh, <laughs> which was a bad that was just a bad call on mom's yeah. part so I guess really I have mom to thank for Potterless <laughs> with mom didn't make me read that damn Lion Witch in the Wardrobe book when I was way too young I might have liked magic growing up and this all would be different. That's true. <laughs> Especially because you used to copy me with everything. So I'm like, why isn't he reading these books? <laughs> did I copy you with everything? I guess. When we, you were I did really dance little, because really of you. Little. Oh, when I was really little, yeah. And then you did dance and then I did dance. But yeah. you were big into soccer and that was not my steez. I did no, not. we definitely did different sports, but mm-hmm. you at least okay. tried soccer. But we're both Gryffindors, so that's yes, good. that is true. <laughs> it must actually run in families. <laughs> it needs to. So chapter 19 is called Elf Tales, mm-hmm. and it has what I think is the best opening to any chapter ever, which is just Fred, <laughs> Fred Weasley going, quote, so all in all, not one of Ron's better birthdays, uh, which if reader or listener, you will remember, this is 
has happened right after Ron has been nearly poisoned to death. Fred is so perfect. Since like halfway through book five, his quotes have been on another level. So I are you saying love Fred, Fred is better than George? Or, yes. Okay. For a while, I thought it was head to head, like pretty neck and neck. Mm-hmm. They were even in terms of who made funnier jokes. But at about the halfway point through Order of the Phoenix... He just started making better quips and more jokes. And I feel like he's had more of the sassier, snarkier remarks. And I love that. So I have pledged my allegiance to Fred. I originally wanted to give it to George because I felt bad that they're always referred to as Fred and George and not George and Fred. But Fred's just better. So (laughs) I hate to say it. So they're in the hospital wing. And with Fred is Harry, Hermione, Ginny and George. Apparently what happened was that Madame Pomfrey only let them in at 8 o'clock and Fred and George got there at 8.10, which I think is so sweet that they, you know, they like to tease Ron and make fun of him. But at the end of the day, they still rushed over to Hogwarts to go see their brother, well, which I, mean, I think is really rushed. sweet. Rushed. They can Yeah, apparate. you do learn. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> well, you can't apparate into the school, but oh, you do learn true. that they were in Hogsmeade, so they were yeah. close. But at yeah. first I was like, oh my God, Fred and George came all the way from Diagon Alley. They didn't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they, well, they caught on the next flight over and <laughs> <laughs> so George says that this isn't how they envisioned handing over their birthday present to Ron and Fred hits him with another great quote and says yeah when we pictured the scene he was conscious <laughs> so uh, he's so perfect he is good. I was just thinking about it too I guess they say Fred and George because F does come before G mm. in the alphabet it's alphabetical yeah. and it just like has a it has a nicer ring to it I feel like when you name off stuff you usually go with like the shorter syllable things first and That's even true. though they're both one syllable it's more of a mouthful to say George than it is to say Fred true, true. so it kind of makes sense so apparently they were in Hogsmeade and Harry asks why they were there and they said that they were thinking of buying Zonkos and this is something Dottie and I talked about which I, I think do remember yeah so this is something we talked about which I think is really interesting but they say that they're not sure that they want to buy it anymore because Hogwarts might prohibit the students from going there on weekends so they're like this wouldn't be a smart business decision why would we do this they're pretty business savvy you have they to are to them. they are killing the game mm-hmm. absolutely killing it mm-hmm. george gives harry props for his quick thinking on using the bezor harry says that he was just lucky that it happened to be in the room and then he has the sinking realization of what would have happened if he didn't do it in time and this is something i can relate to just like imagining a worst case scenario in your head and then freaking out about how bad it would be yeah ron could have legitimately died and that would have been absurd he's basically like thanking god for the half-blood prince right now yeah and really Hermione is like so conflicted on how she should feel because <laughs> obviously she hates the half-blood prince and mm-hmm. is so pissed that harry's better at potions but at the same time, she's like, oh, my God, he saved, you know, Ron's life. So she, mm-hmm. she's just like a mess <laughs> and doesn't want to yeah. talk to anyone. <laughs> and the other thing to consider is that if Ron died because of this, it all would have basically been Harry's fault for not throwing out Ramilda's chocolates for like three months. Like he had yeah. no reason to keep those around. <laughs> and that would have been the dumbest thing ever. Super dumb. So well, let's all be glad. Were? Yeah, he, he knew because Ramilda was really heavy handedly trying to get Harry to eat them. I f- he knew something about potions or or something about love potions happening, so it was like on the brain. Right. I think Hermione like warned him about yeah. that, but I didn't know. Oh, because she heard Ramilda and some people talking about it in the bathroom, just like yeah. using potions in general. So when Ramilda tried to get him to eat it, he was scared and was yeah. like, oh, this is a bad idea. Did he like read the card, though, that it was from her? She was like holding them and gave them to him. And then she was like, eat him, eat him, eat him. Oh. <laughs> and I he was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hermione is absolutely shook by the whole thing. Uh, she drops the whole being angry at Ron bit and is just concerned about his well-being, which is very sweet. Well, you know, she is. Yeah, she is. She loves him. Yeah. Or at least is very. And fond. she has a heart. I mean, she's super yeah. stubborn, but obviously like has a heart yes her love can trump her pettiness yes everyone's trying to put their heads together and figure out how this could happen why this would happen fred brings up the possibility that the slughorn is a death eater but i don't really see this being it whether or not he is a death eater because we have the flashback of him like being buddy buddy with voldemort and all that i don't think that it would be an attack on ron there seems like no reason to attack ron individually also this would have to be so specific and would have had to fall into slughorn's lap so well if this really was the point 
I think it's more of an attack on Slughorn, and Ginny supports this. She's like, maybe someone was yeah. trying to get Slughorn to be poisoned because Slughorn's the one with the poison mead. And Harry then remembers the whole memory thing, so Harry starts to think that it could be Voldemort trying to kill off Slughorn so that there's no way to try to get the truth behind this memory that Dumbledore apparently wants very badly. Yeah, I mean, I think just from the way, you know, Harry and Dumbledore basically recruited Slughorn to be a teacher... Mm -hmm it's kind of laid out that he's not a death eater i yeah. mean he's running from them he just wants to be neutral he just wants to live his life <laughs> and like not pick a side he just wants to be luxembourg he, and be away from yeah. everything like yeah, don't get me involved basically like call me switzerland like i don't care mm -hmm. i I'm, i don't want to fight either way <laughs> So I feel like Ginny and Hermione are the only ones making sense about this whole thing. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh my God, why would they poison Ron? Who poisoned Ron? And I'm like, no one poisoned Ron. <laughs> <laughs> like no one cares about Ron. No offense, Ron. Yeah. But like, I mean, I think somebody mentioned it might have been for Harry, but that's like kind of a stretch. Uh -huh. So it's like... Obviously, it's for either Slughorn or somebody mentions that Slughorn was safe. I think supposed, Hermione yes, mentions... Yes, Hermione does. That it was for Dumbledore. Yeah, and you're like, well... Oh, no, Ginny, yeah, Ginny I mean, brings it up. Ginny says that yeah. Harry mentioned that it was for Slughorn to give to Dumbledore for Christmas, so maybe it was Dumbledore's. And this is when Hermione finally breaks her silence and says, well, then the Poisoner didn't know Slughorn very well. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously, <laughs> Slughorn's going to drink this if you give it to him, even if it's supposed to be for someone else. So, yeah, Ginny and Hermione are the only ones making sense of the situation, which is, uh, are we surprised, honestly? No. <laughs> Not no, at all. I'm like, of course, <laughs> the two girls make sense, and everyone else is, like, being so stupid about it. They're so <laughs> good. We really do just need a Ginny Hermione situation. Just, the two of them oh are just God. so good. I know. I mean... <laughs> Trust me, don't I know it? <laughs> so when Hermione finally starts talking, Ron subconsciously or unconsciously croaks Hermione. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's subconsciously just, you know, knows that she's in the room, which is very sweet. At this point, Hagrid enters and Pomfrey says, no more than six visitors allowed, which I think is very specific. And I don't know why six. I know. Like, <laughs> and they made a point to say that Ron was the only occupied bed. But mm -hmm. I like how Madame Pomfrey's like, nope, this rule is law. If like, we've learned I don't anything care. about Madame Pomfrey is she has her rules. She sticks to her rules and she doesn't take crap yeah. from no one. And I love her for it. <laughs> She's so great. But yes, yeah, so George says, well, Hagrid makes six of us. And then the book says, Madame Pomfrey, quote, seemed to have been counting Hagrid as several people due to his vastness, <laughs> which is wonderful. Not surprising. <laughs> Not at all. He is a large deer. So Hagrid raises the point that both of the victims are from the Quidditch team. So that's some sort of connection. And Hermione. Yeah. Uh, well, first he's like, who would want to poison Ron? And we're like, oh my we've God. We've already we've it's discussed not Ron. this, Hagrid. Nobody it's cares. It's not for Ron. <laughs> Though Ron does get accidentally attacked a lot. He almost got knifed by Sirius in the third book when he thought it was Harry's bed. So Ron seems to be on the receiving end of violence directed towards other and people. And he did get bit. Like, Sirius like, had to drag him. Oh, right. Me. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah. Didn't he break? He broke Ron's leg. He broke his leg. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, man. Ron, <laughs> not the best <laughs> luck. So Hermione agrees with Hagrid that there is a connection, but she points to both attacks being fatal in design and both having an item that got into the hands of someone that clearly was meant for someone else. Like clearly Katie Bell and Ron were not the targets. Yeah. And I like how she says... She says, like, that person's even more dangerous because they mm. don't care who they hurt along the way. Yeah, they're reckless. And I'm like, damn, that's a good point. It's a really good point, but I don't agree with this connection. This is a, something I brought up in a previous recording. I okay. think that the connection between the two is alcohol because... You've got the necklace, which Katie Bell got from a package in the bathroom of the three broomsticks, and then okay. the cursed item that Ron drank was mead. So to me, right. that is the link. Now, I am completely baffled that the book didn't describe this or Harry didn't do this. How was the first question out of Harry's mouth not, where did you get that mead? Or did they already discuss where Slughorn got it from? I think 
that they did discuss it. It at least wasn't in this chapter. I don't know if this happens later. I, I want to see where he got this from because, like, let's say he got it from, I don't know if you can buy alcohol anywhere to take home in Hogsmeade, but if he got it from, like, the Three Broomsticks, then maybe the connection is the Three Broomsticks and something's going on there. Very interesting. I don't know who works at the <laughs> Three Broomsticks besides Madame Rose Murta, but I don't know if she would be a secret death eater that we've never learned about. I don't know. My personal connection that I'm drawing between the two is alcohol. I really just need to know where this mead came from before I can jump to any further conclusions. That's but fair. we shall see. This very well could be Ludo Bagman part two where I'm super duper wrong. Well, I like your deep detective skills. No <laughs> well, what I'm, trying, I'm trying to be more thoughtful because I got burned so bad in the fourth book. Well, obviously the depths to which you're thinking are way above a 16 year old's head. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this this is not <laughs> this is not something that when I should have been reading these books I would have considered at all. I would have probably yeah. been like, "Well, who would want to poison Ron?" Uh, so, <laughs> so. Definitely, and I'd be like, "No one cares about Ron." <laughs> <laughs> So then Mr. and Mrs. Weasley enter the room and they are very grateful because, quote, half our family does seem to owe you their lives, which is very true since Harry has saved Ginny, Ron and Arthur. So. But also you have to like counter that with, oh, yeah, I don't think any of their lives would be in danger if they were <laughs> Harry Potter. Uh, this is so true. So it's kind wow. of a catch-22 there. <laughs> Ginny may be the only one. Yeah, that's Arthur, true. Arthur potentially he... because he worked at the ministry. Yeah. And that was like the whole point. Definitely not Ron. Ron would have been fine. Ron definitely would have been fine. <laughs> if Ron doesn't become friends with Harry Potter, he doesn't get attacked by spiders. He doesn't get his leg broken. <laughs> he, a lot of bad things happen to Ron because he's friends with Harry. Definitely. And obviously, Mr. Weasley was guarding the prophecy about oh, Harry. Oh, yeah. That's how okay. he got attacked. Yeah. So maybe only Ginny. Yeah. But if Harry Potter wasn't at Hogwarts, then... That probably wouldn't have happened either. I don't know. Uh. It's just, <laughs> honestly, everything is Harry's fault. So he has to, like, fix it all, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so Hagrid and Harry then end up leaving and going for a walk because now this puts it over six people. <laughs> For real. The golden rule of the hospital wing, <laughs> which we will never violate. <laughs> Hagrid says that he's worried that the Board of Governors might try to shut down the school because this is basically Chamber of Secrets all over again. Hagrid, though, in classic form, lets it slip that Dumbledore is mad at Snape, immediately saying, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, Hagrid is the worst <laughs> gossiper uh, ever. He's so bad. And this was something I really appreciated out of the... Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery iPhone game we're both obsessed with yes, is that yes, you do yes. a side quest for Hagrid and at part of it he talks too much and says oh I shouldn't have said that I definitely shouldn't have said that and you're like classic Hagrid Ugh, so good <laughs> I'm really glad they kept it also fun little thing in the game uh I guess spoiler alert if you don't want to know this anyone playing the game you get to name his dog Fang <gasps> I was just gonna that I'm like oh my god this is so awesome so what do you what would ha even happen if we named him something else I didn't want I wanted to pick the other ones but uh in the game sometimes you have to be a certain level to pick a certain answer and that always means it's the best answer yeah and Fang you had to be level 11 and the other options were what if one was Voldemort Jr. <laughs> and oh, or one was like Voldemort and I think one was someone junior like Hagrid Jr. or something and I was like oh man both of these are so much better I really want to <laughs> pick Voldemort but I guess Hagrid probably would have said no way uh I'll go with Fang yeah but this means if the game is canon then my <laughs> wizard Gryffindor Mike Schubert is the reason <laughs> that Fang is Fang except <laughs> Gryffindor Aurora Fruhoff also named the dog <laughs> oh man well at least we're <laughs> kind of related but it's okay yeah. you're gonna go have a loving relationship with Charlie Weasley and me and Tonks are going to have great pink haired babies I don't know I mean I might go for Barnaby he, he's the hot one oh. he's kind of dumb oh no except for well except no for spoilers I'm only on year two creatures. or year three. Oh, oh, sorry Sorry. No, it's all well, good. <laughs> I mean, clearly he's the hot one. Though. Yeah, but Charlie Weasley's Charlie Weasley. Yeah, but they gave him a ponytail in the game. Charlie Weasley is a ponytail? Yeah. Oh, it's... no. Yeah. Oh, no. I can't do it. A red-haired ponytail? Well, Bill is the one that grows up to have a ponytail. They made Bill way too hot in the iPhone game. Bill he's is a hot. hunk, and it is not okay, because I want to hate Bill. <laughs> he's supposed to be hot, like, in the books, though. Yeah, he's supposed to be the coolest person ever. And obviously... Obviously, like, he's dating, in this book, 
Fleur, who's mm-hmm. supposed to be like the, the hottest, hottest girl, girl ever. ever seen. Yeah. So it's like, obviously, Bill has to be good looking, mm-hmm. right? I, yeah, he's supposed to. But the way that they described him in, you know, the second or third book, he sounded just like every dweeb ever. Like, he's got a ponytail and dragon skin boots and one earring of a fang and a fedora and yeah. a fidget spinner. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was so cool. But no, he, I understand that Basically, he has a cool the job. Most hipster douche ever. Yeah, I, but someone did put in perspective for me that he was of the time that the books take place in in the 90s. That was super cool. So it's yeah, valid. I agree. It's just if someone wore that now, it'd be like, oh, gross, please change. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry gets Hagrid to spill the beans. But I mean, I would expect someone to be like, ew, gross, please change if I was still wearing my butterfly clips in my hair. Oh, like and your jellies 90s. and your slap oh bracelets. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> As you played with your skip it down the hallways of school. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hell fucking yeah. So Harry gets Hagrid to spill his beans. Initially, Hagrid wants to resist. He says, what are you trying to get me fired? Now that you're, why would you even care now that you're not taking care of magical creatures? Oh my God. I which was just- I, this is, first off, this is not okay, Hagrid. I will not stand for this type of woe is me guilt trip. And Harry doesn't either because he says, quote, don't try and make me feel guilty. It won't work, which I get is him trying to just like not let Hagrid do this. But I, I like the subtext you could think of this where you could read this as I'm so self-obsessed that I don't give a shit about you Hagrid it won't work that's true that's true (laughs) I know that's not what he meant though I just thought it was funny to read it that way yeah but it was also funny that Hagrid tried to guilt him (laughs) but really he's just trying to cover his tracks because again he is the worst gossiper (sighs) ever so bad no (laughs) poker face at all none at all (laughs) no and he's like I was first I was like how did he even know about this and then like he talks about you know how uh he kind of overheard it. Yes. Yeah, so first I was like, he always slips. Like, why does Dumbledore tell him anything? <laughs> <laughs> and then I Didn't was like, this in the what, first do you, book? what do you think the teacher's lounge is like at Hogwarts? <laughs> <laughs> It's just anytime Hagrid walks in a room, everybody stops talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, oh God, it's Hagrid. We can't, we can't talk about Dumbledore. Yeah, it, it would be like telling Dumbledore. Michael Scott in the office something. Everyone's going to be told. I know. <laughs> so apparently Hagrid overheard them having an argument where Snape said to Dumbledore that he feels overworked and Dumbledore says, well, you agreed to do this, so you kind of have to deal with it. And Hagrid has a great line where he says he started to hear this and he didn't want to get involved, so he tried to just look inconspicuous. I'm sorry, you're a half giant, Hagrid. You kind of (laughs) stick out, like, just a bit. (laughs) Just a little. Uh, Yeah. It's fine. (laughs) So apparently Hagrid then heard more of this argument and he says that Dumbledore was telling Snape that he needs to do a better job of his investigations within Slytherin House. And apparently all of the house heads were asked to do so after the necklace debacle. Not surprising. Not at all. Hagrid tries to downplay it. Harry, of course, tries to run with it. And then Filch comes up. So Harry basically has to leave. And while Harry is leaving, he starts well, thinking. I like, first of all, I like how Filch is like, wait a minute, detention. <laughs> and Hagrid's like, uh, they're with me, Bubby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Filch is like, what does that even mean? And Hagrid's like, I'm a teacher, remember? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then calls him a squib. So it's like, oh. But, yeah, it was, I supported Hagrid and then he called him a squib for no reason. Yeah. And then I was like, damn, oh, you had to go okay. there, didn't you? Yeah. Unnecessary, Hagrid. Really unnecessary. So Harry's yeah. walking away by himself and starts thinking about the situation and of course all he can think about is how this clearly is about Snape not investigating Malfoy thoroughly enough because it's literally all that Harry Potter can think about. Yeah, and everyone's like, get off Malfoy. He's like, no, it's all his fault. I want it to be Malfoy so badly just so that Harry can have 12 pages of telling every single person told you so. Harry is wondering why Dumbledore didn't tell him that he was upset with Snape, but then thinks, quote, perhaps Dumbledore did not think it right to confide suspicions about his staff to 16-year-olds, which, yes, but especially not Harry Potter, who hates Snape with every fiber of his being. Yeah, Uh, at least you had that thought, Harry. Like, Dumbledore shouldn't tell you everything because you are 16 and he is 
I don't even know how old. A million and a half and is in charge of the school. Yes, he's the headmaster. If he's going to tell anyone, it's going to be like McGonagall. Yeah. Like, get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't realize, Megan. Harry Potter is the most important person in the whole world. Did he learn nothing from last year? Or yes, he learned like, nothing. He's Harry Potter. Told him absolutely nothing. <laughs> oh, man. Harry oh, goes back Harry. to the common room. It's super late, and McLagan is there waiting for him. Such a creepster. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it's the same situation as a parent sitting in an armchair when you tried to sneak out and then you flicks the light on. It was like, where have you been, Richard? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. You're late. <laughs> <laughs> Curfew was three hours ago. McLagan then tells Harry, well, I saw you and Ron going to the hospital wing. Looks like he's not going to be ready for the match tomorrow. And Harry has to think, what is he talking? <gasps> oh, right. Quidditch, which same. Uh, <laughs> there's so much going on that Harry didn't think about it. But unfortunately, McLagan makes a good point that Ron's not going to be able to play. He's the second best keeper. He's going to have to play. Harry begrudgingly agrees and says, yeah, we've got practice tomorrow. I'll see you there. Yeah, again, going back to your fact, why aren't there backups <sighs> already established? Because <laughs> that would make too much sense. Yeah. Oh, oh, pump the brakes recording, Mike. We need to take a step aside because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. You know what's incredibly inconvenient? Going to a physical store to go shopping for clothes. And online shopping doesn't work either because what happens if you order something and then you don't like the way it fits or looks? You gotta deal with sending it back and then sometimes you have to pay for return shipping. Oh my goodness. Well, that's where Stitch Fix comes in to fix all of these problems with your stitches. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna drop the act because real talk, Stitch Fix is unreal. And I just really love what they do and I just gotta talk to you guys about how amazing it is. So here's what they do. You go to stitchfix.com slash Potterless. You create an account. They ask you some questions and it's so great because if your body's got some weird fit stuff going on, they will tailor your clothes to address that. Me, for example, I'm an above average height dude. I'm six feet tall, but all of my length comes in my torso, which makes it really weird. And nobody's ever been like, oh yeah, that guy's got a nice long torso. Like it's not an ideal situation because I'm eternally stuck between smalls and mediums and shirts. So I was able to address this in my fit. And after you address all of these questions, you get paired with a personal stylist. You tell your stylist the sizes that you want, you tell them the styles that you like, and you tell them the price. So you can say, hey, I only want to spend this much on pants. I only want to spend this much on shoes. So they don't send you something that you would never realistically purchase. And when you get your shipment of clothes, you can put in any sort of thing that you want. For example, when I got my first box from Stitch Fix, I said, hey, it's the summer. I would like some shorts and some fun button downs. What did I get in my box? Three pairs of shorts and two really fun button downs. So I got the box, I opened it up, I tried everything on, and two of the shorts I absolutely fell in love with. And the other stuff wasn't my favorite, so I just took it in the pre-made bag that they already put the shipping label on it and everything. All you gotta do is put the stuff back in the bag, seal it, put it in the mailbox. It is so easy. It is so ridiculously easy. And the shipping and the returns and the exchanges are all free. You only pay for the stuff that you actually keep. It's phenomenal. There's a $20 styling fee, but if you keep any of the clothes, that gets applied to it. So as long as you keep something from the box, you're not going to see any sort of fees aside from the clothes that you are actually buying. And there's no subscription required. If you want to, they can send it to you on an automatic basis if that's your style. But if you want to pick and choose like, hey, I got a vacation coming up. I want some new clothes. You can specifically schedule it for whenever you want. It's so great. It is so incredible incredibly flexible. And if you keep all of the clothes from your box, you get 25% off if you sign up with your account at stitchfix.com slash potterless, which is great. So if you do what you need to do and you're very specific in your style and you write the little note to your stylist of what you're looking for, and you can even go into your account and vote thumbs up and thumbs down on clothes that you like, it's great. As the ladies from Spirit said, it's like doing Tinder for clothes. It's so much fun. And there's a different amount you can do each day. But if you perfectly tailor your account, you can keep getting boxes that are filled with things that you absolutely love and then you keep saving 25% on the box. It's great. So again, you go to stitchfix.com slash potteros and sign up for an account. Start getting your pairing with your personal styles today and get clothes that are custom tailored to your desires and fits and styles directly to your door. So it's the next day and the news of Ron getting poisoned has spread throughout 
the school. And in addition to that being spread throughout the school, throughout Gryffindor House, hype is spread to play Hufflepuff in Quidditch because they want to destroy Zachariah Smith, who is a chaser on the Hufflepuff team because he was the announcer of their last match and he was talking mad smack against Gryffindor. So they want to basically wreak havoc on Zachariah Smith, which I fully support because that kid sucks. Yeah, he Uh, does. I forgot, was he part of the DA? He was, and he was always the really snarky one that was trying to complain all the time and make a scene. And and, it's like, uh, why are you even here? Yeah, just leave. Nobody likes you. Nobody likes you. Harry is not interested in the match, though. Quote, he was becoming obsessed with Draco, which I think the word becoming is pretty fun here because Harry's (laughs) been obsessed with him since book one. Why are you so obsessed? (laughs) Right? Oh, gosh, yes. So Harry is getting bugged incessantly by McLagan and Lavender. McLagan trying to talk to him about Quidditch strategy. Lavender asking him a million questions about Ron because apparently Ron keeps. <laughs> so the reason Fake that she's sleeping. <laughs> yeah, the reason that the reason that she's asking Harry so many questions about Ron is she says that every time I go to visit Ron, he's asleep, and Harry thinks, "Huh? Every time I go." He's awake and very alert. And <laughs> uh, this is what I realized. Oh, he's fake sleeping. It's so yeah. good. Uh, which is great because this is something that you will know, Megan, as my sister. Me of and my course. mom used to fake sleep all the time when dad would come home, when he would try to, you know, get us to do anything. And we were always the worst at it. I was the worst fake sleeper in history. Because you guys just laughed the whole time. But I have to say... I did start fake sleeping before you were even born. Mm-hmm. Mom and dad talk about this. Oh, right. How I would <laughs> fake sleep on the couch and they would talk about like, oh, what a beautiful princess. Because oh, they is. would know you were, they would know yeah. you were faking. And they could totally see me smile, but apparently I would let them carry me up to bed and then I would just never come out. And they were like, she's so silly. <laughs> it was, yeah, you thought you're pulling one over. They're thinking, know, uh, we just like, got our kid yes. to go to bed. We're parents. <laughs> This is all we've ever wanted. I know, and I just like keep hoping like that Aurora inherits that, and then yeah, I that can your put tiny her... one and a half year old baby starts doing this. Yes, yes. Uh, I get why it was so awesome for mom and dad. Now, yeah, so good. So Lavender is jealous of Hermione because she is apparently visiting a lot. Harry says, "Come on, they're just friends," and Lavender says, "Oh, really? Is it not just because Ron's interesting now that he's been poisoned?" And Harry replies, "Would you?" Call getting poisoned interesting, <laughs> which is wonderful. <laughs> Hold on, real quick. I'm gonna blow my nose. I'm getting all stuffy. Yeah. Hey, team. It's me, editing Mike. I was gonna edit all of this out, but my sister and I actually have some great jokes afterwards. So I'm recording this in place of me blowing my nose six times. So you're welcome. And oh, we're back. You're right there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I was just trying to get it all out because I realized I was like, oh no, I'm sounding congested, and I have to be very conscious of how my voice sounds since this is an audio medium. Oh. And also, a lot of people uh, recently on Twitter and Facebook are like, oh, my God, Mike's voice is so sexy, so now i got to be sexy. Oh, look <laughs> at you. You're, you've graduated from, like, the voice of God to sexy podcast. Well, yeah, voice. well, it started in high school. It's like, yeah, voice of God reading at church. And then it, when I was making YouTube videos, look at this fucking idiot's face. And then now, <laughs> it's, been, now it's come back to, oh, sexy voice. <laughs> oh, so, nice, nice. yeah, I've, I've done a big 180 from when people were making fun of how ugly my face was, apparently. Oh, it's not true. Eh, to be fair, it is a very long face, and that was usually the uh, the joke that would be made. <laughs> Mine's kind of long, too. I yeah. mean, we have a similar face, We're so family. I think it's... Like I think it's a, a really perfect face. face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with our faces. No, everything is perfect. They are beautifully perfect. So uh, it's the morning of the match, and Harry and Ron are talking about McLagan. Harry scolds Ron for pretending to be asleep for Lavender. Ron says, Thank okay, God. fine, I'll drop it. Sheepishly. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, you knew about that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Harry says, just break up with her if you don't want to go out with her anymore, which Harry finally giving good advice. I don't know the first time Harry's done this but it's been a while (laughs) (laughs) so just before harry is about to head to the pitch he sees malfoy with two girls two girls uh whom look who (laughs) sorry i have to make anytime it's two something i have to make the two chains joke so the book says that they are described as quote both of whom looked sulky and resentful which i think is a weird way to describe human beings so i am very 
confused by what is happening here. My ears perked up. Well, when were I they read Slytherin? Because I think Slytherins just always look like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Good thing you don't have Twitter because you're about to get a lot of angry messages. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know, I know. The book Slytherins are. The book Slytherins. In the Slytherins. book, yeah. I mean, in like, the books, they're all now. racist and the worst. Well, and in, in the real Harry life, Potter not. game. The oh Harry yeah. Game. Oh yeah. Do we know any besides Marula? She's awful well, her, well i guess Barnaby's oh no you know cool. you meet the other guy is he the guy you meet before is he the guy the quidditch guy or is that someone else that was someone else no that's andre no it's not andre um when you have to sneak into the slytherin house to do the quill thing oh i don't know it's like the slytherin prefect you some other guy like his name's like felix oh or something. yeah 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 someone else no barnaby and is melda or something are like marula's hench people but then oh you, they're the crab and goyle yeah basically and is melda is like crazy okay she talks about the killing curse all the time oh like, no she's like legit the craziest <laughs> <laughs> i'm excited to meet her um so yeah I, I think this description of them is very weird so i'm confused about what's going on harry and yeah. malfoy do their classic bickering back and forth and at one point one of the girls lets out quote an unwilling giggle which again i think is a weird description of something unwilling giggle seems weird i don't know if they're under some sort of spell. I don't know if it's an imperious curse or some sort of thing where, I don't know. It seems like they are like, it seems like they're under his control almost. Okay. Well, deep diving into these adjectives. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause it's just, <laughs> it's, it just seems like they're there like against their will. And the only thing I can think of that is imperious curse, but I don't think that Malfoy would be able to get away with doing that at Hogwarts. So I don't know if the, he's got some sort of like potion on them or something, but it seems like they are there against their will is the vibe that I'm getting from unwilling giggle. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't, I still don't really understand how it works. Like obviously they call the curses unforgivable, but also like illegal. But mm -hmm. I also don't know like how you would get arrested doing the imperious curse. Like I don't yeah. know how they trace that one mm -hmm. or even like the cruciatus. If no one's around, obviously the killing curse, like there's a dead body yeah. to, <laughs> to like relate it back to someone. But yeah. yeah. I don't know how you would be like, Oh wait, there's an alarm going off. I know someone's doing the imperious curse somewhere. Uh -huh. I don't they know. They definitely don't trace it at school because they've mentioned when Dumbledore and Harry do the thing where they go back and look that they don't like check it in the school. They only check it in like mm -hmm. things outside of school. But then also it happened in Goblet of Fire in the maze yeah. to Crumb and no one made a big to do about it. So I guess maybe he could sneak it. But yeah, my vibe that I'm guessing is that these two girls are with Malfoy against their will. Yeah. I don't know if he's involved or if someone else did it, whatever, but yeah, I'm very off put by them. Fair. Ginny runs in, <laughs> says Harry's got to get going because the match is about to start. Harry is lingering on the Malfoy thing, wondering what's going on, but she finally snaps him out of it. And they get to the field, and McLagan is trying to coach the beaters on basically how to do their job. Harry walks in, and the first thing he says is, shut up, I'm the captain. Go to the goalposts. Oh, wait a minute. You forgot <gasps> oh, to mention, too. Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. What I missed. Harry notices that Malfoy vanishes from the Marauders map as he's walking yes. away. Oh, that particular time, too. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah, that keeps happening. Okay, good, good to know. And then he has to go to the pitch. Yeah, goes to the field, tells McLagan to get lost, and he goes then up to the beaters, and he gives them the same advice that McLagan was giving. McLagan was like, oh, make sure you stay out of the sun because it's a like cloudy day, no one gets sun in your eyes. And then Harry has to like, go to them and be I'm like, the captain. <laughs> yeah, Harry's like, get out of here, I'm the captain, don't give advice. And then he turns to them and he goes, yeah, you know, actually stay out of the sun. It's, you know, <laughs> which I think is so don't good. Don't tell him I told you, yeah, but, but you should he's probably right. follow that, his advice on that one. <laughs> so the match starts and a, quote, dreamy voice is announcing. <laughs> Ginny steals the quaffle from Zacharias Smith and the announcer then says, Ginny steals the quaffle. I do like her. She's very nice. And at this point, I knew oh, it's Luna. <laughs> and yes! it is. It's the best thing to happen to Quidditch. It really is because it's obnoxious. Immediately, I wrote in my book, this could get ugly. Uh, <laughs> I was, and when I was reading it, I was thinking like, oh man, something that Mike might actually like about Quidditch. <laughs> I did really enjoy her commentary. So she's doing a horrible job. She Obviously. can't remember the score or people's names. At one point, she's trying to call out the name of someone on the Hufflepuff team. And she says, quote, it's something like Bibble, no, no, 
Buggins. And then McGonagall interrupts and goes, it's Cadwallader, which <laughs> is not close at all. <laughs> McGonagall uh, is not loving this. She is no. way too serious about Quidditch. Mm-hmm. Like probably the most serious of the house, you know, the people in the heads, heads of, of house. houses yeah. <laughs> in charge. And she's like, oh my God, stop. <laughs> Who made this girl an announcer? <laughs> I want a spinoff book where McGonagall and Luna are stuck together on some sort of task because <laughs> that would just be the ultimate like buddy cop type of people that hate each other, <laughs> like odd couple situation. It's like the most type A person and the most type B person. Yeah, it would be so good to see the two of them together. So McLagan keeps trying to coach the team while the game is going on which is a problem. Luna is describing things that aren't relevant, such as cloud shapes, <laughs> and McGonagall has to keep jumping in and updating the score, stealing the megaphone from her. It's it's just a mess. And at <laughs> one point, thanks to Luna, Harry realizes that McLagan is trying to teach the beaters how to hit the bludgers, and Harry flies over to try to yell at him to stop doing this, but McLagan hits a bludger right at Harry's face, He then wakes up in the hospital wing, and the diagnosis is that he has a cracked skull. Oh, jeez. Which, woof, 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 woof. Pomfrey says that he has to stay there overnight because he can't overexert himself for a few more hours. Harry says, I can't stay. I need to find McLagan and kill him. And Pomfrey replies, I'm afraid that would come under the heading of overexertion. Pomfrey (laughs) is amazing. She is so good. Ron says that Gryffindor lost the match. 320 to 60. Obviously. Which is pretty bad. Yeah, but you have to think they got 150 points for catching the snitch. So yeah. it's like, okay. But here's the thing to consider. This is why it is absolutely bonkers that you can't have subs in Quidditch. Because as I learned in preparation for the live show I did with Potterless, because I read part of Quidditch throughout the ages, there's a rule against anyone that isn't the seeker catching the snitch. The only person that's allowed to do it is the Seeker. Otherwise, it's a foul. I was going to say, why didn't, like, Ginny played Seeker last year, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why didn't she step up to the plate? But I guess So it's a foul. So here's the thing. If you can't substitute anybody in to play Seeker, Hufflepuff is in a point where they cannot lose the game. Yeah. Unless their Seeker makes the choice to catch the snitch when they are losing by 160, they would not be able to lose that game right. because he could just keep waiting until they were not losing by 160 points and catch it. He could just keep flying and be like, hey, guys, can you score one more quaffle throw? Oh, you did it? All right, great. We're only losing by 140 now. The game could have just go on, gone on forever. So I, I, but oh, I think so like stupid. normally you have to think, though, normally like your own teammate wouldn't have taken down the seeker like it would yeah. have been the other team. And that would have been like a good move for them to do. Take out the seeker with a bludger and then they can win the game. But because it was like an own teammate thing, it just made it, you know, it's so yeah, it much it worse. But I guess just the just <laughs> the concept of not being able to, to substitute in for the seeker. And now that I've learned that the seeker has to be the only one to catch it, otherwise it's a foul. I don't know what the penalty is. I don't know if it's just like a point thing or what. I can look it up. Yeah. But if it is that the game would not end unless the Seeker catches it, why would the first move not be just to beat the shit out of the other team's Seeker? Who cares what the penalty is? If their Seeker can't play anymore, they can't win. So the beaters should just fly over to the Seeker, grab him, and just hit him in the fucking head with their bats until he's unconscious. And then it's like, okay, (laughs) we can't lose the game now. I think that would be a foul if they're just straight up hitting them with the bat. Yeah, but like, what? Whatever the whatever the penalty is, it they can't lose. They literally can't lose if the other team doesn't have a seeker. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Okay. This damn sport. I'm glad that we still found a way to work in a Quidditch rant, even though this was a very innocent match. Uh, so yeah, they lose 320 to 60. Ron says that Ginny came to visit Harry while he was unconscious, and Harry immediately creates a vision in his mind of her weeping over his lifeless body, professing her love for him, and Ron giving him the final blessing. Damn, Harry has some <laughs> real romantic fantasies. Like. He has ramped up his love for Ginny rapidly. <laughs> so... Harry talks about how he should have just skipped the match to chase Malfoy since it was so bad. Ron calls him out for being obsessed, basically saying, listen to yourself right now. You are saying that you would rather skip a Quidditch match 
then play one just so you could creep on Malfoy? Like, give it a rest, dude. And Harry's like, yes. <laughs> yeah, Harry basically says, I just want to. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, subtext. I mean, <laughs> Ginny, I mean, damn. <laughs> yeah. So Harry says, I just want to catch him in the act. And yeah, I wonder where he's going when he disappears from the map. And Ron flippantly guesses Hogsmeade, meaning 1,000%. It is Hogsmeade. I have no doubt that it is Hogsmeade. And again, this could be Ludo Bagman again. But I think the fact that Ron says it in such passing that he thinks that Ron's just like, I don't know, maybe it's Hogsmeade. And then Harry goes, no, he hasn't gone down any of those particular passageways. They're all locked up to blah, blah, blah. And then Ron goes, OK, OK, never mind. Then maybe it's somewhere else. I'm convinced that it's Hogsmeade. So this could go to my theory. This could go to my theory that the three broomsticks is involved. It could all be playing together here. We'll have to see. Well, you will find out in my chapters. Ooh, so cool, cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. We've seen that Ron has the tendency to be correct about stuff when he offhandedly guesses things and not when mm -hmm. he very determinedly thinks, oh, it's got to be Snape and here's why. When he just says things in passing, he's usually correct. So if that okay. holds true here... He is going to Hogsmeade, so we'll see what happens. Harry then is in the hospital wing reflecting on his past injuries, which makes him think of the one that was caused by Dobby with the possessed bludger. Or the, is it, yeah, the ball is the bludger, the people are the beaters. I always get these screwed up. Yeah. He thinks of that injury, which then makes him think of Dobby, which gives him an idea. So he calls out for Creature, who then apparates in, but he apparates in in the middle of a fight with Dobby. So they're wrestling with each other. Peeves even flies in at one point and is cheering them on and yells at Harry, <laughs> hey, I was watching this. <laughs> Apparently Creature was talking smack about Harry, so Dobby started fighting him, and the fight keeps going on while Harry's telling them to stop. But before they do, Dobby punches creature in the mouth and knocks out half of his teeth i have gained a lot of respect for dobby dobby <laughs> is hard Damn, he's feisty <laughs> he is hard he doesn't mess around he freaking loves harry he Potter, really does obviously. He really really does a lot of feelings happening in this chapter yeah, i mean does this make you like dobby a little bit more? yeah so i have transitioned to team dobby ever since he cared for alcoholic winky oh yeah wasn't that sweet wasn't that so sweet? sweet of him so sweet of him so i'm a big fan of dobby now and with this he punched out a dude's teeth Hell yeah, Dobby. I'm a big fan now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, come on. You're a badass. Yeah, Mama said knock you out. So <laughs> Harry then asks the two of them to tail Malfoy, hence the chapter title being called Elf Tales. Dobby agrees and says that he'll throw himself off of the top dresser if he fails, which is on brand, but still too much. Always too much. <laughs> <laughs> when Harry tells Creature, though, he has to run through all the possibilities. He says, OK, you have to find Malfoy, but you can't tell him what you're doing and you can't talk to him and you can't give him any handwritten <laughs> messages and you can't tell any of his friends what's going on and just keeps listing a million He's things. He's like, no loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> no loopholes. He's giving him the full genie treatment where he's <laughs> like, you can't do this. You can't do that. I don't mean this. I don't mean this. All these technicalities. And you can see Creature running through the calculations in his brain and then deeply sighs when he realizes every loophole has been tied up and <laughs> begrudgingly agrees, okay, fine, yeah. I'll do it. And then Harry says that they should stick to him, quote, like a couple of wart plasters, which is the British way of saying wart removal. I Googled oh. it. Because I was going to see if this was some sort of British thing that I didn't know what a wart plaster was, but it's just a wart removal type remedy. With Harry finally giving all these lists of things that Creature can and can't do, that ends <laughs> this chapter of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince and this episode of Potter's. Megan, how you feeling about chapter 19 here? You know, I'm feeling pretty good. I know you're not feeling as good because Quidditch was a part of it. Uh, but <laughs> it was, And it was so close. It was so close to being just a very silly Quidditch match and Luna made it so great in the McGonagall thing thing was fun but then i thought about why don't you just murder the other team's seeker and i got all <laughs> flustered again <laughs> but yeah i'm glad you were able to join on for it i'm very excited for the future episodes because these next chapters there's some uh serious stuff going down this I one know. is a little less so but the next one's pretty real but Megan, thank you so much for joining. And thanks for having me. Obviously, you're my sister. Of course <laughs> I was going to have you on. But uh, usually people have some sort of like thing to plug because they're social media involved or podcasty. Do you have anything that you want to promote? Not really. All I don't right. Think, I mean, my Instagram profile is open if you want to 
look at pictures <laughs> of my adorable baby. You know? She's a very cute baby. Yeah, go check out uh, go check out Aurora. She's super cute. We talked about how cute she was a lot. So yeah, you know, it kind of makes sense if you want. Proof. I mean, yeah, my blog still exists, but I haven't written on it in front. Oh, you got to bring that back, Maggie Frew. Bring it back. I know. Well, the fashion you know. ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after you have a baby, it's like oh, oh I don't man, care I gotta anymore. Be but your I, mom. the recipes I still reference back. I, I do. They're feel good. Like I make the, your smoothie every day. I make it, and I have a new smoothie that I just started making. Ooh. I mean, I feel like I should probably get back onto more recipes. I do find, like, every once in a while I get, you know, notifications that people are, like, pinning my recipes. But Hell yeah, Pinterest. <laughs> get on it. That's still a thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Megan, thank you for joining. Listeners, thank you for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they give you your shot at Madame Pomfrey's hospital wing. <laughs> Wizard on! <laughs> Potterless is a part of Multitude, and Multitude just got a P.O. box, so if you want to send us stuff, you can send it to P.O. Box 3241 in Astoria, New York, 11103. Make sure you address it to Multitude, otherwise they're going to send your stuff back to you. But yeah, if you want to send me anything or everything, I will love anything you send and cherish it and put it in my room and hang it up my walls and do whatever. But just send it to that address. It's also on the Contact Us page at Potter podcast.com if you need that address. Potterless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Serlopu, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamick, Frank Chiodo, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfili, Eugenda Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Luis Nisak, Akansha Saxena, Abid Ahmed, Caitlin Jordan, Pontello, Benjamin Bridges, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Mary Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanera, Camille Doc, Anthony Bonrigo, Diego Matienza, Russell Dunk, Jenny Nilsson, Dustin Will and Cooch, Kitty Rogers, Audra, Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Micah Cole, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Colette Smith, Chrissy Blackburn, Shrina Unacat, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Sammy Curti, Lovkesh Longer, Shivani Patel, Ali Madsen, Kalmage, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Melissa Traver, Emily Krause, Vince Clancy, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Hurd, Courtney Allingham, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Emily Bird, Francisco Batista, Rachel Guthrie, Mary Bushland, Zachary Polito, Gabrielle Medcroft, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Guthnadotta, Brittany Baldonado, Melody McInnes, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swanee, Lexi Vergara, Zach Ross Klein, Elise Figueroa, Daisy Curtin, Stoddard, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Jonathan Foy, Joe Harrison, Isabella, Steve Trelloer, Vivian Santos, Kim Klusmeyer, Samuel Miner, Megan Leach, Ali Ravik, and Sean Cho. Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Kumpamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to facebook.com slash potterless. You can join our fancy private group there. You can go to twitter.com slash potterless pod and instagram.com slash potterless podcast for any and all information about the show and all other fun things that I am doing in the podcasting world. You can go to potterlesspodcast.com. And again, if you want that bonus content, you go to patreon.com slash Potterless. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on.